The Mob Collection, by Audioboy. All content on this channel is free to download, share, and repost. Open source audiobooks, for the people. Chapter 22 Pacing in His Cage from the brochure, Questions and Answers about Federal Correctional Institutions. Question 41. How can I take care of my business while in confinement? Answer. You must appoint someone else to run your business while you are confined. Jimmy Hoffa lived by his own rules, and he would soon develop his own answer for Question 41. The Federal Correctional Institution at Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, that Jimmy Hoffa entered on March 7, 1967, was amusingly depicted in the movie Goodfellas as a place where Italian mobsters were able to live comfortable lives with their own cooking facilities, an endless supply of good food, good wine, and fine cigars. Their battle cry was, let's eat. Surely in a place like that, Jimmy Hoffa would have little trouble learning the ropes and figuring out the most efficient way to pull the strings that extended from the rolling farmland of central Pennsylvania to his puppet regime and the new general vice president, Frank Fitzsimmons, as well as strings that extended beyond Fitzsimmons to Hoffa's former hand-picked staff at the Marble Palace, Teamster's headquarters in Washington, D.C. The prison rules allowed for a total of three hours of visitation a month from a list of non-lawyers. The visitation list was restricted to family members. Inmates were permitted no phone privileges in those days. Letters were permitted to be written to only seven people from a list of relatives and lawyers. All letters in and out were screened. No union officer was permitted to visit or write to Jimmy Hoffa. There was no limitation on visitation from lawyers working on active cases. Hoffa's son was a lawyer for the union and so was not restricted to the family member list. He could see his father as often as once a week. Although the appeals on the jury tampering case had been exhausted, the appeals on the Chicago case were still pending when Jimmy Hoffa first walked into Lewisburg for delousing, photographing, fingerprinting, and outfitting in blue denim. In addition, Hoffa would be eligible for a parole hearing in two and a half years, in November 1969. All of this legal activity meant that Hoffa could receive visitations from a number of lawyers. Frank Regano was among those lawyers who visited Hoffa, consulted on the issues, and carried messages back to both the union and mob figures. Attorney Morris Schenker represented Hoffa on the machinations of his parole strategy and on another matter the delicate maneuvers involved in securing a presidential pardon from what would later be revealed as the corrupt administration of President Richard M. Nixon. Bill Buffalino regularly visited Hoffa in his role of lawyer and advisor. The tight restrictions on visitation hamstrung those inmates without the financial resources, battery of lawyers, or power of Jimmy Hoffa. Many young men did not have relatives who could afford to make the trip to Pennsylvania. They could not use up their three hours of allotted visitation. Jimmy Hoffa would arrange for job interviews for such men with Frank Sheeran. The young inmate would meet with Frank Sheeran in the dining hall that served as the visitation room. They would sit at a table next to Jimmy Hoffa, who would be consulting with one of his many lawyers. I'd pull on my shirt, and the kid would know that was a signal to go to the buckhouse so Jimmy and I could get a little business done. The guard would look the other way. They made out all right at Christmas, those guards. I think every day was Christmas for some of them in the old days. I saw it tighten up quite a bit over the years when I went to school in the 80s and 90s. I think it was on account of the publicity and the new type of inmate especially the drug dealers like the Jamaicans and those Cubans that Castro had kicked out. There was one kid named Gary that Jimmy asked me to help get a job in construction. If they had a job waiting for them, they had a good chance at making parole. Gary should have stayed in. When he got out, somebody put a whack on him. He was a friend of Tommy Barker, 
the one that claimed later on when I had my trial in 1980 that I told him to whack a guy named Fred Garonsky for spilling a bottle of wine on me at a bar in Delaware. Joey McGreal was in there with Jimmy for a while toward the end. Joey had settled down.